Uh, welcome to this Centre for Policy Studies uh, forum held in partnership with the Campaign for Economic Growth. My name is Tom Clockerty. I'm Head of Tax and Editorial Director at the CPS, uh, and I'll be chairing our proceedings this afternoon. Um, our topic is a, a hugely important one, one that's absolutely central to the work of the Centre for Policy Studies, and it is enterprise, 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 the key to the recovery. Um, and in fact, there is a question mark on the end of that title, though I'm not sure we'll get too much disagreement from uh, our outstanding panel um, as to the importance of enterprise and, and business in bouncing back uh, from the, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, you know, I'm genuinely excited about the group that we've assembled to speak to you this afternoon. Um, and I'll introduce them very briefly uh, in reverse speaking order. Um, we have Catherine Fletcher, a member of parliament for South Ribble. Uh, we have Tim Steiner, the co-founder and chief executive of Ocado. Uh, we have Emma Jones, uh, the founder of Enterprise Nation. Uh, and then kicking things off for us, uh, we have David Sismi, uh, who is director of the Campaign for Economic Growth, our partner um, this evening. And the, the, the format is gonna be pretty straightforward, about five minutes from each of our speakers in opening remarks, and then we'll open it up uh, for a wider conversation. Um, those of you watching at home can submit your own questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, please keep those questions uh, short because I'll have to be scanning them uh, while everybody's talking and trying to uh, sort of work out, juggle, juggle the topics we want to put to the panel. Um, so before I hand over to David to, to get the ball rolling, let me say just a, a, a few very brief words um, about why this sort of thing matters so much to the Centre for Policy Studies. Uh, and, you know, uh, we've, we've been about economic growth for a long time, but I think uh, right at the beginning of last year, before the pandemic really, it even became clear how serious it was going to be, we were already thinking about how to orient all of our work around this key theme uh, of boosting economic growth, of promoting enterprise and, and ownership and opportunity. That was really the, the raison d'etre of the Center for Policy Studies going into 2020. And of course, the pandemic and all of the economic problems that have stemmed from that have just thrown the task ahead of us into sharper relief. Um, you know, but the vital importance of coming up with practical policies um, that can achieve those ends. But you know, I think the, the thing is when you sit in Westminster and you work in a think tank and you do policy, you spend all your time thinking about the things that government should do, or perhaps the things that government shouldn't do or could do better. Um, but it's vital that we don't lose sight, I think, of the fact that government only really ever sets the conditions uh, in which growth can occur. And it's the private sector that is the engine of all of the prosperity that we want to see. And so I hope that we can get some of that perspective uh, into the conversation this afternoon. Um, again, our topic is enterprise, 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 the key to the recovery. And I'll hand it over now to David Sismi. David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you um, <clears throat> to the CPS. And it's great to be doing this uh, event in partnership with you and the CPS. And can I also have my thanks to Tim, to Catherine and to Emma for their time today. And I know uh, we'll get some great insight from them. Uh, it's one of the few benefits of lockdown, I guess, that we can organize this sort of thing for a late on Friday afternoon and not be worried about turnout. <laughs> and I'm not sure that uh, we can live up to the liveliness of a handful of parish council uh, meeting, but, uh, but hey, let's try our best. Um, so is enterprise the uh, the key to the recovery? Well, you know, to coin a phrase, yes, yes, yes. Um, it's businesses that create jobs and profits in their own firms, which pay for the jobs uh, and, and in our public services. And the speed with which businesses recover and grow will be directly proportional to the speed of the recovery we see in the economy and ultimately to tax revenues. And you know, I've said this before, every 1% of you know, economic growth delivers another seven or eight billion pounds worth of tax revenues uh, for the government. And so this is the best tax rise. Economic growth is the best tax rise in the government's armory. And that's why uh, I set up the campaign for economic growth with uh, Andrew Griffith and Lord Jung, who between them have you know, phenomenal uh, business and political experience, because this is just such an important cause. And success in unlocking strong enterprise-led growth will help provide the prosperity to tackle many of the other pressing issues in, in society. And, you know, wow, you know, businesses have done such a fantastic job over the past year. They rapidly adapted almost overnight to carry on serving customers. 
uh, where they've been allowed to. They've innovated in ways which will deliver value you know, long beyond the crisis. And they've been quietly and successfully delivering for customers, which I'm sure you know, Tim will talk a little bit more about uh, in a moment. And so when I think about the recovery, I think <clears throat> the government just has to be obsessed with enterprise and growth. And of course, it's not about intervening, it's about creating the strongest foundation for enterprise to flourish, and then it will. But clearly the first step has to be providing a roadmap and timetable to fully opening up the economy as soon as that's possible. And beyond that, I think government needs, uh, or sorry, business needs three things of government. Firstly, facilitating access to, uh, to markets for our products and services. Secondly, uh, removing points of friction uh, and barriers to doing business. And thirdly, providing the right fiscal, frame, fiscal framework. We have some of the most entrepreneurial people in the world. And you know, we're sitting alongside someone that started a company 20 years ago that's now worth over 20 billion pounds and employing you know, thousands of people. And so you know, if we get this right, we get more Ricardos, we get more deliveries, we get more gym shops, we get more dark tracers. And we also get tens of thousands of businesses that will stay small. And they're the backbone of the economy and jobs with 60% of people employed by uh, an SME. So what's needed? I'll start with I'll start with three ideas and then and then we can go across you know to the other panelists as well. You know, Liz Trust has been doing a great job opening up. Uh, world markets for business. <clears throat> and I'm delighted that we've now formally applied to the CPTPP. Um, what I'd like to see is following up <clears throat> that with stronger incentives on embassy staff, maybe creating a dedicated deputy ambassador, for example, with business experience everywhere to promote British companies in the country that they're operating in. And I quite like the idea of export vouchers um, for companies as well. The vast majority of companies haven't exported before. And so they face costs in, in doing so. And if we can give them export vouchers to, <clears throat> to unlock that for the first time, I think that'd be very powerful. The second thing is re-examining our regulatory framework to make sure that every regulation is actually worth it. And taking small firms out of scope for certain regulations, I think, is, uh, is, is a good thing as well. Um, the Campaign for Economic Growth has been suggesting that we have an Office of Regulatory Assessment, which is established to do a full-scale audit of all of our regulations in much the same way that Canada did very successfully several years ago. But in the meantime, we really welcome this new Tiger Task Force uh, that Ian Duncan Smith and others are leading, uh, which is supposed to be doing some of that work. And then finally, reintroducing an enterprise allowance. It won't come as any surprise with Lord Young, you know, as our president, that we think that's a good idea, which will give unemployment, uh, unemployed people an alternative to looking for a job, starting a new company. And also allowing firms to use their enterprise levy towards mentoring and, um, <clears throat> and mentoring entrepreneurs and providing advice. So those are three ideas to kick us off. And uh, I'll uh, let you hand over to, uh, to Emma. Yeah, David, thank you very much. Um, Emma, if you want to uh, pick it up from there, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and um, lovely to be here. I know that part of my job is not to respond to the previous speaker, but I can't let export vouchers go without a comment on that. So when Theresa May became Prime Minister, she set up a council uh, to look at scale-ups, enterprise and entrepreneurship, which I co-chaired with James Timpson and Brent Hoberman. And the one uh, recommendation that I put forward in the year of that council was export vouchers. And I have to say, I think we were getting a bit of traction uh, when Theresa May was prime minister. We'd got DIT involved. Uh, the other business organisations were backing it. Um, and I hope it's not impolite to say this on a very open and public webinar, but uh, when Boris Johnson became prime minister, he had one meeting of those business council chairs. And again, I put forward the idea of export vouchers and I will never forget his response. Um, and the response of the current prime minister was, I don't want to pay people to export. They should just know to do it themselves. So um, I'd love to think we could still pick up that export vouchers idea, but I think it would need uh, a little bit of evidence behind it. But super happy to work with you, David, on that. Um, but lovely to be here. My name's Emma Jones. I'm founder of a business called Enterprise Nation. 
We're a private sector company. We've been going for a decade plus, and we are a business support platform that helps over half a million small businesses each year. And again, just listening to David made me think I should probably give some context to the type of businesses that come to our platform every day looking for support. They are the smaller end of small businesses, so they're naught to 10 employees. So of course that landscape that David mentioned where 99% of businesses in this country do have less than 10 employees, that's very much the enterprise nation market. So of course we have a very close view on the challenges and opportunities that those small businesses face. Um, and I know that one of the lines that was given to me in terms of uh, comments to cover today was how businesses have adapted over the past year. And they have been incredible. So three things to mention that have been particular observations at Enterprise Nation. Uh, one is mass digital adoption from small businesses. So in the past year, we've run programs for Amazon, Uber and Facebook, all of these big tech brands who want to ensure that small businesses know how to use these enabling digital platforms to keep on trading with their customers. And all of these programs have been hugely oversubscribed. So every time we've gone out to our community in the past 12 months and we've said, what content do you want? What training, what advice do you want? The huge cry from small businesses has been, I want you to teach me to be able to do more online. So there's been mass digital adoption. And I guess one thing, um, a consideration for both government and the private sector at the moment is how do we continue to bed in those digital habits into small businesses? Uh, the second um, trend behavioral aspect that we've seen from small businesses over the past year is that they have run into the arms of advisors, which we hugely welcome. I mean, we're in the job of delivering business support. So accountants, HR advisors, they've all been particularly busy over the past year. And actually, you know, I quite often find myself saying this at the moment, no one would have wished for COVID. But actually what's coming out of this is a base of businesses that are much stronger and fitter than they were when they went into this episode 12 months ago. They have understood the need to look at the cash flow, to know that the money is coming in, to understand debt finance, because many of them have now taken loans and therefore they have sought advice from accountants on that. They've needed to furlough staff, maybe sadly make some redundant. Businesses that we've seen scale have been looking to hire very quickly and therefore they've looked to support from HR advisors. So we've seen this wonderful and in fact um, some research that came out from British Business Bank showed we have reversed a decade long decline in businesses accessing advice. So for the past 10 years businesses have lessened their access to advice, they haven't been seeking it, COVID has completely reversed that and businesses are now looking for support. We think that is a good thing. And again, how do we bed in and create that as a behavior and cultural change to go forward? And then the final aspect, if anyone ever says to me, kind of, you know, what have you seen from founders in the past 12 months? Um, there is a very psychological aspect to what business owners have just been through. And what I'm hearing from a lot of fellow founders is this kind of mental resilience that they've built up where so many founders think if I've managed to get through the past 12 months, I'm still trading, I've got through COVID, I've got through EU transition and therefore they're kind of almost feeling if I can manage that then I can pretty much manage anything. And Tim will know this as the founder of a big business. I'm founder of a company with just 30 people, so a minnow compared to Tim. But one of the hardest challenges when you're scaling a business or starting a business is the mental aptitude and resilience to just keep going. So as I say, again, just another positive that I think we can take from the past 12 months. And very briefly, what would we love to see government do? Um, I've got three things that really echo what David said and we'll cover in brief. Uh, the first is confidence. The more that government can imbue a sense of confidence in the small business community, the better. I was hugely relieved today to see the front pages of so many of the newspapers talking about the Bank of England report that there's 150 billion in UK household savings that's about to be spent. 
um, in our company at the moment, we're talking about the great reopening. So getting small businesses ready to accept quite a bit of that expenditure that's about to take place. So the more we can deliver that confident message, and I think the government has got a role in doing that, the better. Uh, the second is continuity. So um, I'm a little bit nervous about rhetoric on the topic of tax at the moment. I have to say I'm pretty nervous about the March budget. Um, there is talk of capital gains tax for entrepreneurs relief, which is unnerving uh, a number of entrepreneurs. Of course, there's talk about the tax rate for the self-employed. And the one thing that I feel that entrepreneurs have been through, they've had so much chopping and changing COVID, you know, brilliant government support, but then changes, then EU transition. And the one thing they need when it comes from a tax perspective is some continuity and a framework that they can just understand rather than rates up, rates down, understanding what comes in when. So some continuity would be welcome. And then the final thing is uh, celebrating entrepreneurs. And I'm sorry to refer to a, a previous prime minister on this event, but David Cameron was particularly good at this. Virtually every speech he gave and, and during the time of David Cameron's uh, rule or era, I ran a campaign called Startup Britain, which was backed by Steve Hilton. Lord Young was in fact um, the originator of this campaign. And we had kind of three years where virtually every speech the Prime Minister made had the words entrepreneur in it. He talked about strivers and doers, makers and bakers. He talked about creating the conditions for entrepreneurial growth. And I have to say, I'd just love to see a little bit more of that kind of rhetoric come back into the speeches of those at the heart of government. So uh, they're my comments and I look forward to the Q&A session later. Back to you, Chair. All right, Emma, thank you so much for that. They're really great reflections. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot there that we can pick up on further in the, the discussion and the Q&A. But, uh, but now let's uh, hand over to Tim Steiner, um, Chief Executive of Ocado. Tim. Hi, Tom. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, so I'm Tim Steiner. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, Ocado. Just uh, hopefully I've got some customers uh, listening today. So thank you for your business. Um, just to give you some idea of our scale today, today we're, we're only about 1.7% of the UK grocery market, but that amounts to about two and a half billion pounds a year run rate. Um, that's actually a smaller part of the value of our business today. Today, we're probably about 17,000 people um, across the world, the vast majority here in the UK. Um, we are two and a half thousand engineers, um, software, uh, electromechanical um, et cetera, robotics and, and all the other fields that we're involved in. Um, we're now helping nine companies worldwide um, to run a similar service to Ocado in the UK. We're helping them with um, full end-to-end -end cloud based software systems and robotics and uh, uh, other material handling infrastructure inside their facilities. So all the, all the software they need and all the infrastructure they need to be the best in their, in their field. Um, we are in eight countries doing that. So um, the crisis has been very difficult in terms of, we launched the first two international warehouses in uh, Toronto and in Paris in April, May, June time. So just, you know, if you told us six months earlier that we would launch these facilities without being able to visit them, we would have told you that was Im impossible. But when impossible is the only way to, to do something, that's what you have to do. So our teams did an, an, an amazing job to do all of that remotely. Um, the crisis also for us was obviously very different to most businesses in the UK. We had a completely opposite uh, challenge. Um, we obviously were allowed to carry on trading because everybody needed to eat in the country. But we did at one point have um, about a thousand times the amount of web traffic we'd ever seen before. Um, so obviously our infrastructure couldn't hold up to that. So having built a business for 19 years to encourage customers in, we had to write systems to try and actually keep customers outside the door and decide which customers could come through the door and what they were allowed to buy when they were inside. So all controls that were never there. And rather than planning that and thinking it and writing it and testing it and all the stuff you'd normally do in business, we had to do that live on the fly whilst trying to stop the people coming into the door to break the system. Um, so our teams did a, did a fantastic job doing that. And we uh, got control systems in place and we were able to service both our loyal customers and the vulnerable customers that we the, the, the government had asked us to serve. Um, and we grew our business um, 
35, 40% uh, in the face of having, you know, had a business plan that was supposed to grow about 10 to 12% uh, uh, before that. So we managed to eke out that at the same time as managing um, enormous amounts of staff disruption, uh, concern from the staff about coming to work, enormous levels of absence that peaked at 30, 35% in some areas at some points in time, rolling out our own unique uh, um, testing. So we've tested hundreds of thousands of of tests on our staff um, months before uh, any government uh, uh, measures in the same space to make sure we didn't get community uh, uh, transmission in our warehouses, which we've been successful to avoid so far. So look, we're, we're carrying on with our business. We're expanding globally. We're hiring. We're hiring a lot in the UK. We have 11 development centers uh, where there's two and a half thousand people around the globe today, but most of those people are still in the UK. Um, we want access to markets, of course, as, as, as was highlighted before. Uh, we want as little friction as possible, as was highlighted before. Um, we don't want um, any strange tax changes. Um, I'm very, uh, uh, I would like to repeat what Emma was saying about, I think we really do need to talk up business. We need to see business as a positive, not as a negative, not as a greedy uh, um, thing. We need to talk up entrepreneurs. We need to talk up wealth creators. We need to talk up investors because there's a lot of other countries right now that want to emulate the success of the UK in the last 20 or 30 years of attracting people to start businesses, of attracting people that have made wealth into those countries to go there, set up that as their base. Um, and actually, we're, we, we've got a very negative tone around around wealth, around entrepreneurship and around business that I think we definitely need to do our best to reverse. Um, planning is, it, it is, a, is a concern as well. It's very slow and can be painful in the UK. Um, consumer demand for you know, massive amounts of online services is, is growing faster than planning is, is, is allowing online retailers to access the space that they need to serve those uh, um, uh, uh, customers where they would be paying business rates on those sites, despite the debate that online retailers don't pay any, which is obviously nonsense. Um, so react really fast, I think is the key. There's a lot of, of, of money in the economy right now. Some people clearly are suffering terribly, but um, sorry, but there's a lot of uh, uh, um, pent up demand. As soon as things are, are relaxed and people are able to spend money, they want to spend money. Business has proved to be extremely nimble. They were ext those businesses that were able to trade, those businesses that weren't able to trade, that have survived, have all shown how nimble they can be and how they can survive this year, how they can thrive where they need to. And I think if we just let them get on with it, they will create the jobs that we need in the economy going forward. Tim, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, and again, so much that we can we can pick up on there and discuss further. Um, but before we do, um, we've got our our final speaker. Um, so over to Catherine Fletcher, MP for South Ribble. Hello, hello. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, the CPS and the Campaign for Each Economic Growth are doing really important stuff. Um, let me start by saying I complete the set. So we have a huge businessman in Tim. We had a we have a successful businesswoman in Emma. And uh, up until about 18 months ago, before I was elected, I was the micro business just getting started with um, super impressive growth rates. If you work it from a very small level of, you know, three figure percentage growth year on year. Um, and I did that off the back of my background. So I have worked um, in management consultancy and a number of kind of change and operational roles and ended up ultimately being um, in the strategy department in one of the high street banks in the small business banking division. And I decided to go and put my money where my mouth was and understand what it takes to not only finance a business, but actually start one from scratch up north and make it happen. Um, what was that? That ended up being 70% of turnover was export and and i did that touching on a number of the themes that emma's already talking about you know very minimal marketing budgets using the opportunities for facebook instagram google adverts google's ad manager and um, using the different online platforms as well as using the opportunities that the north of england provides in terms of lots of space relatively low rent so that's perhaps something that we can get into and a skilled practical workforce as well as excellent distribution hubs in the airports like Manchester and Liverpool if I speak to the northwest so I hope you can tell what that is is a passion for entrepreneurship that's been dragged into the house of commons um, I've recently been honoured to be nominated as the prime minister's trade envoy for Mozambique and parts of southern Africa 
And I think that touches on some of the points that both David, Tim and Emma have made. Um, Department from International Trade is really starting to build up not only a cohort of parliamentarians to go out there and sell Britain and sell what we can do, but look for mutually beneficial trade. You know, we're all business people are interested in business here. This is not a zero sum game. Uh, and one of the things, maybe just to pick up on one of the things that both David and Emma mentioned in terms of export vouchers, we may not be paying you to start exporting, but there's a particular scheme that I think it worth maybe referring to when we get into the panel of UK export finance, where there is access to incredibly favourable terms for both the seller and the customer. Uh, it's run on a commercial basis, but we're, you know, with... A, great teams in mission, the DIP team and the FCO working together, we've got a fantastic opportunity and a, very, a recently expanded, you know, multi-billion pound fund for a British business to get a foreign foreign customer and, and shape that deal and make it happen even in challenging markets. Um, what else would I say? Would I say that this established party and, and and as well as the new MPs that have come in along with me in 2019 do we care about economic growth by hell we do so um so it is genuinely the talk of the tea room I share an office with one of the newly appointed SME ambassadors we have the series across the country um where we're sitting down and we're working out how to unlock growth for all businesses of all sides, micro, medium, large, you know. So maybe I'll pause there and look forward to the Q&A and a bit more excitement about business. Catherine, thank you very much. That That's great. And actually, it, it leads on to something that I, I'd like to sort of kick off our, our discussion with, actually. And it's um, it, it's come up in a few of the, the remarks about government's attitude towards business, whether it does enough um, to sort of boost business, to boost entrepreneurship and, and really speak the right kind of language that's going to attract uh, investment and, and, and businesses and so on into the UK. Um, and so, Catherine, I mean, obviously, from, from what you've said, your, your experience on the inside is that um, signs are encouraging that, that stuff is moving in that direction, that the government and parliamentarians have this sort of at the, the forefront of their minds. But I'd be interested to hear a little bit more from, from the other panellists about what would really be helpful um, from government. Not Maybe we can get on to sort of specific policy changes, uh, but in terms of the the, mu the mood music and the, and the general idea of Britain as a sort of enterprise nation. Sorry, Emma, to, to steal that uh, wonderful tagline. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know if, Tim, if, if you want to expand on your comments there a little bit first. Um, and then I'll bring Emma and David in. Look, I think it, it, it's partly the government. It's partly just the kind of the rhetoric, the media, et cetera, who definitely don't, um, uh, you know, they don't see it as an honourable way of, of, of making money, for example, as, you know, starting or running a business. I think that they're very comfortable at the SME, you know, at the, at the smaller end of the SME level. But as you start to, to, you know, try and build bigger businesses and people ask, why are there not bigger businesses in the UK? Why are, are you know, the ones that we mentioned before, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Netflix, why are they all based out of the US? And I think it's easier to build a business in the US. It's easier to sit at the top of a business in the US than it is here in the UK. Um, and so I think a lot of businesses in the UK get sold out too early. Um, we were super excited this year because we bought out two, we spent $300 million buying two US, tech, US Canadian technology businesses. So we were like proud to be kind of reversing that. But mostly it's the other way around where businesses start to have some traction here. Some you know, big US company rides in and takes them out. And you ask yourself, well, why, why does the entrepreneur in the US happy to kind of see the course and stay at it? Whereas here they, they kind of want to get out. And partly it's because we don't love them in the UK. We, we, we don't, you know, we want to criticize them at every juncture. We want to complain, we want to criticize, we want to look, you know, uh, uh, kind of look down or, or, you know, judge them in, in, in a negative way. So, and, I, and part of that does come from government. And yes, I, I completely agree with Emma. David Cameron's government was definitely very encouraging of business. Uh, the May government was completely dismissive of business. Um, obviously, Boris's government has had a, you know, uh, something else to worry about, if so I mean. So we haven't had a normal time to see whether he was going to revert to, to the Cameron ways or, or continue with the May ways, we don't know. And COVID has completely, uh, you know, taken over. 
Um, but I think it would be good. We, we, it, we, we, all the way through, we need to encourage people. People need to understand more about business. Maybe more business needs to be in the curriculum. Maybe more people need to learn about business, business heroes, about the, the, you know, the fact that uh, uh, Jim Ratcliffe or Ineos or something like that. And people need to think that their, their child could be the next Jim Ratcliffe rather than kind of thinking in a way that my child could be the next pop star, my child could be the next sports star, but my child's never going to be successful in business. Business people are evil. You know, and I think we need to turn that rhetoric around and encourage business. I'm with Emma on the on, on the on the taxes thing as well. I mean, we're scaring business people with what might or might not come in March, whether we're sounding them out or not, but it's definitely scaring people that I speak to a lot. I can see someone else wanted to speak. <laughs> no, Tim, thank you. I mean, I, that's such an important point that it's not just government, it's sort of general attitudes towards towards business. And I think sometimes it's unhelpful the way we talk about business in, in policy circles, you know, we'll often even as, as advocates of business and enterprise, it'll be look at the tax revenues these create, look at the jobs, you know, politicians, this is this is what you want. And of course, that is something that you want as, as politicians and the government. But I think we also need to be really clear about the fact that businesses create enormous value for us simply by doing their job as businesses, groceries, you know, to the door. So you don't have to go out shopping uh, during a pandemic. What a wonderful thing. And, and, and as you say, that, that narrative um, tends to get lost a little bit. Emma, I, obviously you can respond to anything you want there, but I'm also curious um, about whether, you, do, you, do you feel like government listens to small businesses in particular? Um, I know I've spoken to lots of people running, as you say, sort of micro businesses, the, the 10 employees and less, um, who think, you know, gov big business has the ear of government, um, but they don't really care about us. Uh, you know, is that is that your experience? Is there something we can change there? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the question, because it leads on to, to one of the things that I was going to say in terms of how can government do better? And one thing I was going to say was understanding the market. And actually to that very point, because it um, answers this question, um, you may have seen a couple of weeks ago, there was a, an announcement that the Prime Minister had launched a new business council, which is called the Build Back Better Council. And I don't know if anyone on this panel looked at the... Um, council members but they were all big business admittedly actually dark traces on it but they were all huge businesses and I just kind of thought wow this sends out such a bad signal there wasn't an entrepreneur on there there wasn't a single small business and um, to that point one of the things I was going to reference because I, I hate kind of moaning about things without thinking that we can do something as a solution so Back in 2013, again, sorry, into the in the David Cameron era, he had a special advisor called Daniel Korski. For those of you that knew him, Daniel was very pro-enterprise. At that time at number 10, Lord Young literally sat in number 10. He was called entrepreneur in residence at number 10 Downing Street. Daniel Korski was a special advisor. And at that point, we started to take every month 20 small businesses in to go and see Daniel. And they were incredible experiences. These tiny businesses from all parts of the UK went behind that black door. They met with Daniel and they said, right, here are the challenges and opportunities in my life. And here's the one thing I'd love government to do to make my life better. Every month, Daniel would take notes. We carried that on for two years um, in his tenure. Uh, when Theresa May became prime minister, Jimmy McLaughlin became a business advisor. We carried on those monthly visits. And then just like Tim said, when Boris became prime minister, there were huge distractions and there were other things to do. So our visits stopped. Anyway, when this Build Back Better Council was announced full of big business, I called up um, the now advisor in number 10 and I was just like, it just sends the wrong signal to small business. So I'm delighted to say we're resuming those small business sessions. So we've got our first session on February the 15th. Again, 20 small, small businesses from across the UK will virtually meet two of the advisors and they will just give the advisors a view into their life. And it's just when an advisor sees that, I think it just really helps them understand this is the market of businesses for whom we're trying to help. So I think understanding the market is one thing. And just the second thing that we're imploring government to consider at the moment is to not always think that government has to do everything. And I always remember this makes me feel all very old, but when Mark Prisk became business minister, which probably was about 10 years ago, I will always remember him saying, when you become a business minister, your plan can't be do nothing. 
You know, you have to have a plan to do something because you're a government minister. People expect you to do stuff because everyone's always saying, what more can the government do to help business? And so I understand the reticence to do this. But if anything, our message is government, you don't have to do so much because the private sector has hugely stepped up to support small business and therefore recognise that. So as a final thing, the new Secretary of State had a roundtable last Friday. And the one point I raised is, please embrace the fact that the likes of Amazon, Uber, Facebook, Dell, Microsoft have all launched incredible training programs in this country in the past 12 months to help small businesses flourish. And I think the government could do a better job of saying, well, actually, let's recognise and embrace that and accept that government doesn't have to do everything. So I'd say government knowing the market more and kind of understanding the small business customer and secondly just accepting what the private sector does rather than thinking government has to do everything itself and uh, maybe if, if david and catherine before we sort of start to move on to questions from the audience could just um address this this question a little bit as well uh, maybe david first and then catherine as our our politician on the panel will will come to you for for a final thought here um just the way that the mood music around um government and business and public attitudes to business and so on you know david how, how big a role do you think this plays in your campaign for economic growth trying to sort of change that mindset oh i think it's really important i think it, it is important because you know and, and tim said originally you know we need to have a culture that is really really pro-business and there's you you just look at the last week or two i saw an article the other day criticizing pfizer for making money for example from the uh, from the from the covid vaccine and you think well <clears throat> no, obviously astrazeneca is not it's doing it for nothing but the only uh, they only have that ability because of course they're making money from other drugs and i think pharma has done big pharma has done a fantastic job in riding to our rescue from this crisis in saving you know, ultimately, this is costing the economy in the UK a billion pounds or so a day, let alone kind of all the uh, tragic lives that have been lost. And so I certainly don't criticise someone like Pfizer for making some money for bringing a drug to market so quickly. And we need to celebrate that. And I don't think we celebrate enough. There isn't enough of a response when, when, uh, when firms like that get criticised. I have to say I'm quite optimistic. Um, about uh, what the government can do on enterprise, though. I mean, let's let's be fair to the government. I mean, you know, Boris only had you know a few months before the election, when obviously he was uh, very focused on delivering Brexit. You know, 2020 has been all about uh, COVID, and so I'm actually very optimistic about you know where we can go from here. And I think if you listen to some of the language that Boris was using in his leadership election. Um, and in the early days of his uh, premiership, he was very, very positive towards uh, business and towards the con and, and, and about the contribution of business to uh, the economy. And so I think as we come out of the crisis over the, the next few months, hopefully, I'm very optimistic that the government can turn to this. We're here to make sure we hold their feet to the fire in that respect. But I do think that this is something that government will take up the initiative on, really try to power ahead. And, you know, as Tim said, you know, business, uh, um, government needs to be really, really positive about what, what business is delivering. You know, some of that, for example, is, you know, let's look at the honour system, for example. We honour, you know, we honour all our senior civil servants. We, you know, give them gong after gong after gong. There aren't that many senior business people who get uh, who get uh, similarly honoured. That's just one small example. But we don't celebrate success enough. And we need to celebrate the success of business and we need to celebrate profits as well. Yeah. Um and, and Catherine, um, do you sort of agree with what's come before? I mean, I know uh, you've already described that, you know, you think the government is is doing a lot on this. Of course, it can always do more. But um, do you think that that, that real pro-business angle will come to the fore uh, as we hopefully move past the worst of the pandemic? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, in that you, you almost think I was defending the government's record. I was actually just getting excited about this stuff that yeah. I've seen as I've come in as a relatively new MP, where I've gone, oh yeah, that's amazing, right, let's do that, how do I help? You know, expanding the trade envoy network, appointing small business ambassadors, um, you know, the engagement, you know, like Emma, I've met with the new Secretary of State for Business Quasi in the last week or so, and, you know, his questions are, what do we need? What can we do? So behind the scenes, there's lots of people talking in, with great enthusiasm about pulling down barriers, all the points that others have made, which is the stability business needs to get on. 
in terms of celebrating, I also think it's important to note a real groundswell. So I think I've stood up in the chamber and gone on record saying, you know, if somebody if somebody creates a job for somebody else in the community, when they walk in the local pub, they should be celebrated. We should be buying them a pint. It is the equivalent of some of the wonderful volunteering that's been done. You are serving your community by creating roles, especially if you're creating those roles from export revenue. And, and what was interesting was the kind of murbling noises and text messages I got afterwards. You know, to me, it's almost a self-evident statement, but the enthusiasm that people forgot, have got for it. And, um, you know, one thing that the, the, the audience may want to get engaged in, uh, I'm on the judging panel along with um, a couple of other MPs and business people for the Octopus Entrepreneur Awards, which is still open. So if anybody wants to nominate a great business, please do so, because it's my intention to celebrate these people from the rooftops. And if I may, uh, you know, both yourself, Tom, and the and the audience may have detected a soupçon of an accent that I've got up here. You know, how how do we make business feel part of a community outside of the shining spires of the metropolitan centres? What does it mean for business for you? Well, part of that is to bloat down the pub that needs a pint by him for him when he creates a job from export. Oh, ab absolutely. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And so let's um, let's shift to some of the questions that have come in uh, from the audience. And I'll try and sort of pull these some of these questions together. Um, maybe I'm abusing my position here as chair and, and also head of tax at the Centre for Policy Studies to, to go to tax first. Um, it's obviously come up a little bit in the conversation already, but maybe if we can address it directly, you know, there's there's a few things which seem to be on the agenda for the forthcoming budget. They've talked about corporation tax going up from, from 19 to perhaps 24%. Um, they've talked about uh, capital gains tax rates being aligned with income tax rates, so potentially going as high as 45% for successful entrepreneurs. Um, and I suppose we've also, there, there was a suggestion um, early on when the government extended um, sort of support during the pandemic to the self-employed, um, that self-employed people might get um, different tax treatment in future, shall we say. Um, and that would probably be me, mean more national insurance contributions, um, higher dividend tax rates, and so on. And, and when you look at these things, and they're, they're very much part of the mood music in the run up to the budget, I, I don't know which, if any of those things are going to come to pass right away. But I wonder if the panel would like to comment on, you know, in practical terms, what the impact of those kind of moves would be. How bad would this be, both for Britain's standing as a business-friendly country, uh, but also for, for investment and growth? Um, and Tim, I mean, you mentioned this before, but maybe if you sort of want to amplify your answer at all, um, it, it would be really interesting to hear from Ricardo's perspective and, and your perspective. Well, you know, I'll speak from my perspective for a moment, but uh, you know, if you start a business and you, you're, there's a 20% capital gains tax regime, if capital gains tax moves to 45%, you've got to make an extra 45% increase in the value before you're going to end up with the same amount of money. So what is the actual encouragement is to do one of two things, sell the business before the tax rise comes in or sell your stake. If I didn't own my stake, I probably wouldn't be as motivated to do my job and to carry on growing our business and go from uh, you know 20 billion to 40 billion or 100 billion that we're trying to do. Um, if I you know, or you leave the country, that's the other option. And, and if you look at these, the two biggest entrepreneurs that we've had of our generation, which I guess are James Dyson uh, um, and uh, Jim Ratcliffe, you know, they both left the country. The timing of that is not strange, is it? They left the country just before the election because of the rhetoric coming out of the opposition, right? Uh, um, weren't gonna hang around just in case they made a change on their first night. Um, so they're gone. And will we get them back? Um, we're not encouraging them back now by, by sending out a very strong signal that taxes aren't going up. Uh, we're actually sending out the mixed signal that they may be going up and other entrepreneurs I know are leaving. So I think it's very, very damaging. I understand the motivation to raise taxes. I understand people thinking that, that this isn't fair and that isn't fair, but, but we've got to look at this on a global basis and you can go to other countries and do things at other rates. And we need to encourage people to come to the UK. We need to encourage people to stay in the UK. And we need to encourage people to grow big businesses in the UK and not worry that 
your historic gains of the last, in my case, 20 years, but in some people's case, longer than that, are suddenly going to move when you sell them from being taxed at one rate to another. So whereas when you change income tax or corporation tax, it is a going forward change. When you change capital gains tax, it's affecting gains that you already have, which is kind of, as I say, I, I would... I could either sell up or I've got to sit back and make 45% before I'm back to my same starting point. Doesn't work. Muted myself, of course, sorry. Um, classic Zoom mistake there. Um, I mean, I think I'm right in saying that if we if we raised capital gains tax, the top rate to, to 45%, um, that would give us the highest marginal rate on shares um, anywhere in the OECD, um, which is a pretty extraordinary position for global Britain to be putting themselves in, I would have thought. I want to ask you quickly, Tim, before I move on um, to the others, are there positive tax changes that, that you would want to see that you think could help uh, business and help recovery? Uh, someone in the comments has mentioned capital allowances, um, for example, uh, but, 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 you know, anything that you think could help? I think the one thing that I would love to see is, um, again, things like, you know, entrepreneurs allowance, only stopped if you didn't own 5% of your business. But if you need to fund your business and you need to grow and grow and grow your business, then, then you'll dilute yourself underneath that. I was diluted underneath it before I ever sold a share. So wasn't able to benefit from it. We, we like to have share ownership in our business. I think it's an enormously positive thing. So you can give something, I think it's 30,000 pounds of stock options to an employee and then that's it. But what if, we, you know, then they're no longer tax advantaged, but why don't we have a, an, an amount every year that you can give them? Because it's a one-off grant. So if someone stays with you for 15 years, it's still the same one off grant. So then you encourage them to sell their shares, exercise their options and sell them. So then you can give them another grant. It doesn't make any sense. You know, so we should be encouraging employee share ownership and companies sharing, uh, um, you know, risk and, and upside on the, on, the, on the enterprises that their people work in. And there are a few tax advantage schemes, but I think we should be doing more because most employees would rather have cash today and actually, they're much better off when they don't. We, we've had hundreds of staff make, you know, a hundred, you know, and it could have been anyone in our organization who made a hundred thousand pounds on a, on, a, on a save as you earn scheme because of the fantastic performance of our stock. We'd love to have more of that. Um, and so I'd love to see things that encourage more people or encourage us to, to, to you know, share equity upside with our, with our staff. Emma, you just unmuted yourself suggesting you might want to chip in and if we if we keep this brief on tax and I'll move on to some of the other issues afterwards but but go ahead Emma. Yeah I'd just say two great things that previous governments have introduced EIS relief which has been a brilliant tax relief for people investing in companies so hopefully that's going to stay and R&D tax credits have really helped small businesses so there's been some very good things and just Tim talks rightly about entrepreneurs being nervous about this capital gains tax. I know there's um, a letter that's been signed by two and a half thousand entrepreneurs and sent to the chancellor to say, please reconsider this. So it is that point around the signal of, is the chancellor listening to the entrepreneurial community? But also just, this is at all levels. And I saw in the um, questions, there was a question around the self-employment and as you say, that national insurance equalization. And I will never forget um, the day the chancellor had introduced the furlough scheme and then he kind of waited. And then the next support package was the self-employment income support package that he introduced back in those kind of days of March of last year. And he introduced it. And so, of course, all the self-employed people of Britain sighed a huge sigh of relief of great. There's a support program out for us. And a journalist at that briefing said to him, Chancellor, will this result in tax rises in the future? And honestly, I will never forget his response because pretty much he had a very diplomatic way of saying yes, because if the self-employed are coming to me at this crucial moment and they're expecting to be treated as employees, so they also want a support program, then at some point I have to equalize the tax that I'm taking. And in that one moment, probably 20 years worth of effort to try and get the self-employed recognized as entrepreneurial people starting out was probably ruined in that one moment because the chancellor rightly said, if self-employed are coming to me saying, I need support subsidized by the state as if I was an employee, that's gonna have repercussions down the line. So it's a shame that that happened a year ago. I think we will feel the effects of it in the March budget, but as all of us have said, I think it sends out a dangerous signal that does the chancellor recognize people starting and growing businesses is a good thing. 
Um, and David and Catherine, wave at me if you really want to jump in on tax. But uh, if not, perhaps we move on to... Oh, David, just go quickly. Yeah, yeah I just would like to say on tax, because I think it is quite important. I mean, I think, look, I think all of us here believe in low tax economy and think that increases the um, speed of growth. At the same time, we do have to have fiscal discipline, right? And I think the danger of you know having not just in a single year but year after year after year in the future of spending more than we're raising in tax it just unleashes a lot of spending um commitments that people think can be fun that people don't think need to be funded that people can be, think can be funded purely by debt and so you know i think you know i'm certainly not in favor of um <clears throat> of significant increases in tax but i think this is why we're having this debate right which is if taxes have to go up in some small area where is the least damaging part i think capital gains tax will be hugely damaging i think a very modest increase in corporation tax particularly if it was combined with what you were talking about some allowances especially something like full expensing for example deferring that corporation tax impact on uh, capital expenditure for many years. I think that would be okay. But capital gains tax and any changes to the entrepreneur's allowance, I think will be wrong. Yeah. All right, so I think a, a good topic to, to move on to now is, uh, well, think about some of the other constraints that the businesses face. And something that's come up in the questions um, is about lending, particularly to smaller businesses in the UK. Are our lenders too risk averse? And I know that we're, we're much more reliant on bank funding uh, in the UK for business than, than in the United States, for example. Um, so to, to all of our panel, and I'm, I'm happy to perhaps give this to Catherine first since she didn't get a chance on the last one. Um, do, do the banks need to do more? Um, does there need to be more uh, sort of faith put in potential businesses? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? I, I think I just, uh, when I look at the whole picture, I think it's the law of averages. I don't think it tells you anything. I think you've got to get under the data because there are certain sectors and characteristics of businesses that are quite comfortable and capable of accessing finance, um, particularly if you've got good geographic links in the southeast of England or you're in a growth sector and you've got a lot of people ringing you up saying you want any money. Um, so my interest has always kind of slightly slid towards who's not at the top of the charts, because ultimately that's what's dragging, that's what's producing the drag on the overall average. And you start to see lower rates of, um, you know, access to finance in women led businesses. You start to see it diminish when you're getting further away from kind of centres of finance in the city. And, and I've done a little bit of kind of examining personally why that is. And I think there's two or three things that we need to think about breaking down as government, not necessarily in a heavy handed way, but in a light handed way. And interestingly, they end up all, they're, they're both practical and cultural. Um, Northerners, I've been phoning people up uh, with the I mean, let's just be clear, enormous support package that we've had out there to support businesses through. And some of the stories that come back about what that's done practically to save individual businesses, it, it does warm the heart. I won't go into it, but I think everybody knows that. Um, but you would phone people up and say, well, what about a bounce back loan? You know, it's interest free within 12 months. You know, you can use it as working capital just to help get you through, maybe drive some of the innovations. And I've had a lot of northerners say, but we don't have anything on tick. You know, we don't want debt. Debt is the devil. So I think there's an education piece to help, especially the smaller end, understand that debt is not the same as the guy knocking on your door when, you know, culturally they were going to take your house off you if you didn't pay the rent. You know, debt is a tool to help you buy that, you know, in my instance, 25 grand machine. It was either buy a man or buy the machine. And the productivity challenge in the UK would suggest you better off buying the machine than the man but the machine requires debt finance where you can probably just about afford the man if you just do it on an overdraft which isn't seen as debt so i think there's that but i i also think that there's something about encouraging female entrepreneurs to both be given a hearing as well as actually have their own interests so i can speak with some experience of this in terms of going to try and access support and broadly getting left out of the place and I can't be the only one, you know, the lads club kind of saying, well, you know, I'm not totally interested. So I don't mean that they're two panaceas for the whole problem, but they're kind of two examples of the series of low hanging fruits. I think we can pick to start to solve the problem. 
Yeah, and I think I think to be fair, I, I framed that question in terms of don't the banks need to do more? When you speak to people from the banking industry, they often say they they really want to lend to small businesses, but often the businesses aren't coming to them. So there is there, there's there's two sides to the coin, if you like. Um, I think you, something you hinted at there was sort of perhaps better financial education, more sort of understanding uh, in the population at large um, about sort of business concepts and, and, and debt and so on. Um, and Tim, you know, I, I'll pick on you because I think you mentioned in your, your earlier remarks, uh, maybe we need some of this stuff in the curriculum. Uh, maybe we need school children learning it. Uh, I mean, sort of based on on your experience, what would be the, the really key lessons that um, we should get younger people learning that, that could perhaps set them on a path towards successful entrepreneurship? Well, Tom, I think you, you know, you've just touched on some of it, isn't it? There is a low level of understanding of business, how business works. There's a low level of understanding of balance sheets. Unless you've studied you know, economics or business or finance at university, people don't know what a balance sheet is, what the difference between equity and debt, the different types of debt and you know, all these instruments. And therefore, there's some kind of a, a scaredness, I think, about them. And, you know, obviously, some people can learn about them when they need to. But it would be far better if there was a broader understanding. Um, you know, we understand a lot of, you know, basic physics, or we learn to speak a foreign language, or we learn about what type of clouds there are in the sky. But I'm not sure that knowing what, what type of cloud there is, is would actually be as useful to the population to understand the difference between debt and equity and what a credit card is and, and what an APR is and, and all these type of things. So why don't, why, why don't we educate people? And I agree a lot of what, of what Catherine was saying in terms of my experience in the banks. And I, I think they're not good with, with women. They're not good, as good with minorities as they should be. But I think they're also not good. I think they look for and they say they want to lend money, but they want to lend money to asset back businesses against the property. You know, that's where they feel comfortable. And actually, the new emerging world is not about owning a property. The new emerging world is about owning, is developing IP and developing design and developing a, you know, a product that doesn't have an asset back behind it, but that the world, that the world market wants. And so, you know, we, we found it very hard financing our business. We predominantly financed it with equity that we went out and raised ourselves. But debt financing was always incredibly difficult because it wasn't as easily understood as if we were just buying properties and sitting along the property market. Yeah. I'm conscious that we're getting towards the end of our allotted time. And so I, I just want to turn to a question. Perhaps this is less of a, a Tim Steiner question, although, of course, we're always appreciative of your your views and um it's come up a couple of times in the questions i know people in the country in general are concerned about it and it's the sort of the future of the british high street um the city center business um and perhaps if we start with sort of david and, and emma and catherine on this um what can we do i mean I, at the moment town centers really are, are sort of ghost towns um, and the hope is they'll bounce back but but we can't be sure um is there other things that can be done yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I don't think we should be um, just trying to go back 20, 30 years and try and try and keep uh, keep something that that uh, is not going to necessarily have a future. But at the same time, I think there's, there is a place for high streets. They need to reinvent themselves and they need to be allowed to reinvent themselves and reinventing themselves is partly, you know, having some of that space move to property, uh, to, to residential property, and part of it uh, probably to um, recreational as well. And so fewer shops, more recreation, more, more residential property. And I think through the planning system, and I think through the tax system, particularly with business rates, we need to help facilitate that change. But I don't think we can try and pretend that we can turn the clock back and have people necessarily shopping in the same way that they were 20, 30 years ago. And I think that sometimes is, is suggestive of government policy. And I think that's wrong. Uh, let me come in, Tom. I, I think David's absolutely spot on. And I see kind of the, the shoots of um, a policy suite that starts to deliver that. So you look at, you know, lots of our town centres have got quite strung out or have had the transport hub pulled away so that they've got a, a bit disaggregated. And things like the, the, the towns fund, for example, you know, putting that, that kind of putts prime capital in to just allow for that reinvention that then makes a mixed use environment much more exciting you you can hear me continually and unapologetically start talking about outside of the major urban areas uh, but there's that and i also think the planning reform in that the ability to turn a shop back into a premises should the white paper be accepted really makes a difference and we start to come back to almost a series of villages within an urban environment of mixed use 
Um, I'm not one that wants to kind of bash the online retailers. I want to see the rest of our business community access some of that world and look for different ways to serve the customer. And whilst we're backtracking, Tim is spot on. Um, uh, business education, the Young Entrepreneurs Network, you know, getting people back to understanding what it is. I was selling hair bubbles, would you believe? The South Manchester hair bubble market has never recovered from its early 90s foray, 90s foray. But that kind of idea that this is something for me, it's something that works. And I think a suite of targeted investment um, and relaxation and freedom to change is really important. Mm. All right. And, and Emma, if you want to address that, but also I think we've reached that point, unfortunately, where I want to give everyone a chance to sort of make some final remarks and, and perhaps draw some lessons from the conversation we've had. So, uh, Emma, if you go first with with that and then I'll I'll move along. Uh, so mine is of complete optimism. And just on that retail point, I know I've mentioned this a couple of times already that we don't like to look at problems without creating a solution. So we ran a campaign in 2019 called Clicks and Mortar. We opened up physical shops and filled them with online sellers. And we're bringing that back to the high street from this summer. So we actually think that thousands of online sellers who've done well over the past 12 months are actually now going to be looking for an opportunity to meet their customers in person. They're going to test physical retail and hopefully get to like it. So overall, we're incredibly optimistic as this big spend and the great reopen begins. I think it will offer great opportunities for small business. They will find these opportunities regardless of government intervention. But as we've said today, what we would love to see the government continue to do is celebrate and champion entrepreneurship. And then I think we will be in a great place where enterprise, enterprise, enterprise definitely leads us on the road to recovery. Great. Uh, David, final thoughts? Yeah, look, I think you know, 2000 and, uh, 2019, the government was preoccupied with Brexit. Last year, it was uh, it was COVID. Uh, this year, it needs to be enterprise. So just, you know, let's make 2021 the year of enterprise. Great stuff. And Catherine, anything final? And then I'll give Tim the last word. And yeah, there's a positive, which is that I love that everyone's engaged. I will take away the uh, the kind of some of the pessimism about the idea that this isn't a government that's batting for business. It's genuinely not my recognition. And is there more that we can do to provide that reassurance? So I'd like to thank everybody for that feedback. Brilliant. And and Tim, uh, Tom, I'd just like to jump in with two thoughts on your last point in terms of the high street. The high street was there for, as both a destination and for distribution. What the online's done is it's done the distribution piece better. So now it's only valid as a destination. You don't need it to be able to pick up a, a dress or a pencil that you can have delivered to your home more easily. So it needs to focus on, on where it's useful as a destination, which is things like local services, whether that's medical, whether it's dental, whether it's beauty, whether it's cafes, whether it's you know local services, and it can absolutely come back. I have no fear about that. The biggest thing that's holding it back is not business rates. It's upwards only rent reviews. So it's that archaical view that was always going to get more valuable and the rents just go up and never come back down. We need to have some law that creates freely floating uh, um, rents and gets rid of the monopoly that the property owners have had for years. And then the government can charge 40% on the free market rate, uh, free market rent in rates, and they'll earn whatever they earn. That would work. And that was a tax on the actually on the on the property owners, not on the occupiers, even though the occupiers pay it because the rent will just adjust to it. But so I think that that's really important in terms of next year. I absolutely agree. We should have a year of enterprise. We should encourage enterprise and enterprise, you know, is incredibly nimble. And you know, all these small, all these businesses, small and big, who have massive, you know, done enormous changes through the course of this year to survive or to thrive or to serve their communities, you know, to do what was needed of them. And they react far faster than government ever can. Government should largely step away from the field and let and remove the frictions and let enterprise get on with it. And enterprise will create a vibrant economy. Oh, that's that's wonderful. I couldn't think of a, a better note to end this discussion on. Than that, I'm sure if we were all in person, I could raise a, a big round of applause for our for our panelists and indeed for the the entrepreneurs and the the job creators among them. Um, but you'll have you'll have to take it for granted that that is happening. People are sitting in their bedrooms and studies at home on a Friday night and applauding their their computer screen. So thank you all so much um, from us at the Centre for Policy Studies uh, at the Campaign for Economic Growth. Um, and let me just close by saying you can, of course, uh, if you've enjoyed this event. Um, 
follow us on Twitter, sign up for our email bulletin uh, and go to cps.org.uk where you'll find details of future events and the ability to sign up for them. Uh, other than that, let me just say I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend um, and wish them all the best for the future. So 